Hello, everyone. This is Dr. G with Talk and Tea Time with Dr. G. Today's episode is being sponsored by Mr. Michael Bilbrey, Esquire, and he is with the Bilbrey Law Firm. When we come back, I will be discussing today, you can still live a purpose-filled life after a setback. This is the story of a boy who didn't talk for a long time. The boy liked things to always be the same. Any changes would scare and upset him. The unknown was an unfriendly place. The boy was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. He wasn't trying to be mean, it just made him feel uncomfortable. Sometimes he would flap his arms again and again. One day I found out I have something called autism. My family got me help. Slowly I found my voice and learned all the way I could live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at autismspeaks.org. Welcome back to Talking Tea Time with Dr. G. I am honored to have in the studio with me today, Mr. Dwayne Wiley. Welcome to Talking Tea Time with Dr. G. Thanks for having me, Dr. G. And thank you for being here. Today, I'm gonna to be discussing with Mr. Wiley that you can still have a purpose-filled life after a setback. So, Mr. Wiley, let's just start with you giving me some background information about yourself. Well, my name is Dwayne Wiley. Most know me as Scrap. I'm um, 40 years old. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, Illinois. Uh, graduated from Lovejoy High School. S uh, class president in 1998. Uh, I have a daughter, Kaylin Wiley, uh, married to Ebony Wiley. Uh, I have two brothers, one deceased, uh, two stepsisters, older. Um, and that's pretty much, you know, life growing up was not bad at all, okay. really. You know, my mother, she was young when she uh, had me, uh, 16. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, back then, you know, the village raised you. So that's right. I was raised by my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom, she lived across the street, but uh, both of my grandmothers were really you know, instrumental in raising me because my mom was, you know, my dad also, but I had aunts, mm -hmm. uncles, cousins, you know, it was the village. Right. So childhood was, was, was fairly, fairly good. Okay. A lot of love in the house. Great. So I, I've heard you say you grew up, you had a, a great childhood, you had the village that raised you. And then you graduated class president. So after high school, that's when you ran into some problems yeah. and you were incarcerated. Yeah. So let me ask this question. What led you, what led you to the fast lane? What, what led you to say that this is the road that I want to go down? Really, peer pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, I ain't gonna even say peer pressure. It was like not wanting to accept who I was. Like, you know, I made good grades. I was a pretty good athlete. And you know, people would say, hey, you smart, and mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to be that. Right. I wanted to be cool, and, mm -hmm. you know. So after high school, I went and got a job at uh, American Steel. And you know, I was 18, amongst a lot of grown men, and you know, I was working, making good money, and I got laid off. So if, you know anything about Brooklyn, you know, they used to call that Little Las Vegas. Yes. So yes. it was all night town. I was exposed to a lot, saw a lot. 
So when I when got laid off, I said, I'm going to, you know, just go out here and try to make a few ends, mm -hmm. you know, just to, you know, make some money. Not knowing that it would turn into an addiction. Yes. So I went out and said that I was going to do this for a certain amount of time and a certain amount of time turned into years. Okay. Okay. So I heard you say that peer pressure was a lot of it. And then you had a great job, you got laid off. And so the alternative for you was, okay, I'm going to turn to the streets and I'm going to try this and I'm going to see what happened. So did you ever, did you ever think that you would get caught? Or did you say to yourself, I'm going to do this for six months, then I'm going to get out the game. Did you ever think that you would get caught? No, no. Uh, one thing about me, I'm very observant. So even before I stepped out, I, I just watched. Mm -hmm. I watched certain people. I even had, you know, people in my family, you mm -hmm. know, that I watched. And I just kind of seen how people were doing things. And I was like, yeah, I ain't going to do this. I ain't going to do that. You know, mm -hmm. I thought I had a better way of doing it. Right. You know. Yes. And, you know, I, I had a run. I had a long run. Mm -hmm. And it was so funny because... I was wanting to get out, but it was mm -hmm. like it just had a grip on me. Right. You know, it was exactly. like fast, that fast, easy money. Yes. It's like, yes. Hey, I could work two weeks making good money, mm -hmm. but I could make one deal and cover my paycheck. Yeah. So it was it was hard. Okay. How long were how long were you incarcerated? What was your sentence? My sentence uh, was seven and a half years. I end up serving four and a half. Okay. Yeah. So. So during that during that four and a half years, what was your biggest challenge while you were incarcerated? Uh, I I really just had to accept mm -hmm. everything that happened. Mm -hmm. You know, couldn't blame anybody. Just really had to grow up. Mm -hmm. Do a lot of growing up. It was like college for me. Right. Once I was removed from the the outs, the inside, and you know, I was on the outside, you know, looking in. Now I could really see mm -hmm. the the bad decisions and choices and where I went wrong. Okay, what kept you what kept you motivated while you were incarcerated? What was your motivation? My grandmother that raised me before she passed away, two thousand nine. She told me that she was proud of me. Mm. And I wanted to do everything possible to, you know, not let her eat her words, even okay. though she was, you know, deceased. Yes. And I nicknamed my daughter after her. Okay. So my daughter, you know, that was like, mm -hmm. I lost my grandmother, but my daughter was like, right there, like, yes. not her replacement, but mm -hmm. she like filled in that position. And okay. You know, I just wanted to be that father that she really deserved. Okay. So once you were released, what was the hardest thing you had to deal with and how did you deal with it? Uh, man, the money. Not having what I was used to having. Mm -hmm. But I had such a great support system. Great support system. If it wasn't for my support system and humbling myself and remembering where I, where I come from, mm -hmm. you know, the experience, like I never want to go back to prison. Right. So I know if I step back in that lane, either I'm going back to prison or I'm dying. Okay. Wow. Wow. Okay. So we are going to take a short break. And when we return, I'm going to finish this conversation with Dwayne, AKA Scrap, about how you can still live a purpose-filled life after a setback. Hmm. Maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made home ownership happen. Homeschooling yourself on loans, beefing up your credit score. So I'm pre-approved. You were like, yes! Sorry. Color coding listings, ticking boxes, and flushing every toilet in a 20-mile radius. Home sweet home. 
UA's House Hunter. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. Not completing high school is more of a social thing than it was an academic thing. Even though all these years have passed, I still had that longing to have my diploma. I have a mentor, and she convinced me to continue my education. No one receives a diploma alone. If you're even considering getting your high school diploma, go get it. You can do it. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Talking Tea Time with Dr. G. If you are just tuning in, I am here today with Dwayne Wiley, AKA Scrap, and we are talking about living a purpose filled life after a setback. So, Scrap, let me ask you this question because I know that you are heavily involved in your church right now. So, who or what was responsible for helping you develop that relationship with God? Well, my grandmother. Penny Walker, she, she laid the foundation when I was a kid, and my Aunt Sheila Slade, I always went to church with them, and you know, she made me go to church every Sunday, whether it was with her or my aunt, hmm. uh, up until I was about 12 or 13, and uh, you know, one Sunday I woke up and <laughs> I was didn't want to go. Mm -hmm. And she was like, you don't have to go if mm -hmm. you don't want to. Mm -hmm. She was like, I done instilled it in you. Mm -hmm. But after that, it was like, I would go occasionally mm -hmm. and then I lost my way. But uh, it was my daughter's grandmother, Sandra K. Harris, that, you know, she used to talk to me about church, you know, and she passed. And I, I had never made it, you know, to church. But during that time of her passing, I met her pastor, okay. uh, Pastor Don Sanford. He was the former pastor of Canaan Galilee. And we had a conversation. And it was a, a real good conversation. It was, I mean, it felt, it was just so natural. It, it, I mean, no judgment. Mm -hmm. And we just had a good talk. And I just felt real comfortable. Okay. And like probably the next Sunday I attended and ended up joining. And awesome. Man, some great people out there. Great. So if you could, if you could go back and change one thing about your past when you were in the streets and when you were dealing, you were in the fast lane, you were making the money, you had the fancy cars, the fancy homes, the fancy clothes. If you could go back and change one thing about your past, what would you change? I, I mean, me, I think that everything happens for a reason. Of course, I, if I, I mean, if I would have made a better decision, I wouldn't even Mm -hmm. sold a drug period but I think what I got myself into helped me get to where I am now so I, I really I mean I wouldn't have touched drugs because I know the effect now yes. you know but then I wasn't thinking mm -hmm. that way right. it was just money okay you know okay. great so now let's fast forward to the present and I see that you have some apparel with you today. You are the owner of Kingdom Clothing. Yes. So can you give me just, where, how did Kingdom Clothing get started? What made you say, I'm going to start an apparel line? Um, when I got home, uh, of course, uh, people were, I got involved in a lot of community work and churches were reaching out, you know, mm -hmm asking me to come and, you know, give my testimony. And this one particular pastor, 
uh, Pastor April Bell, she called and uh, she was like, Scrap, where are your brand? I didn't have a brand. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I would uh, wear Art of Homage, God yes. is Dope, you know, right. any Christian urban apparel, okay. I would always wear it yes. and I would get compliments on it. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking, like, when she said that, I was like, that could be me. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, okay. And basically, it was really just to, uh, you know, when I went to places to have something maybe on hand, maybe, you know, just mm -hmm. T-shirts. Right. And, and uh, basically to bridge the gap. Okay. You know, what I, wanted, what I wanted to accomplish with Kingdom Clothing was to reach out to those who are not so sure mm -hmm. about, you know, Christ. Right. And then those, you know, who were with Christ. Okay. And just kind of bring us all together. Okay, I know? love it. So I see here today that you have, you have this t-shirt here, which I absolutely love. And so the t-shirt, the fanny, fanny pack, pack, and then you also have the shorts to go with the T-shirt. Okay, so this is a this is an entire set. set. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. So how much would this go for? This entire set, all three pieces. That set would be seventy-five dollars. Okay, seventy-five dollars. You all, it's different, it's unique, and it's worth seventy-five dollars. Great quality. So can you share with us the T-shirts and the hat that you have over here? The hat and this T-shirt is like a set. Okay. Everything is pretty much twenty-five dollars. Okay. So this shirt here, I would pair it up with this cap. Mm -hmm. Ta-da. I love that one. I love that. I wasn't that's so one sure about faves. this was like my wife's favorite. Yeah, I love that one. Because I'm basic. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, a lot of color and bright. Yeah. I love that. She I love that. She always telling me I need to step out of my comfort zone. So. Yes, I love that. So on the average, a T-shirt is probably about 25. Yes. Baseball cap. 25. 25. And then if you want to sit, it's ma it's basically I'm hearing around seventy five dollars with the fanny pack or without. Yeah, the fanny without pack. I mean without fanny pack fifty bucks. Okay, great. I absolutely love it. I love the concept and I love the fact that you were able to step outside of your box. So a shout out to Pastor April for you know calling you and giving you that push. So I absolutely love that. So I want to tie this all together because I heard you say before you stepped out into the fast lane that you were working at American Steel. Yes. Now, if I am correct, you are currently employed at American Steel, correct? Yes, I okay, am. Okay, so I say that to say, you left American Steel, you got into the fast lane, you were incarcerated, you served your time, but now you're back there and you are employed there. Yes. So that within itself, to me, is encouragement to someone that even though this young man had a setback, you were still able to live out your purpose in life. And I think that's what it's all about, knowing that even though I had a setback, I'm not going to allow that to stop me from doing what I know is yes. in, if that's inside of me. Yes. So, Scrap, what type of advice would you give to a young person today? If you, you know this you, you know, young lady or this young man, you know they're going down the wrong road, what advice would you give them? Be yourself. It's okay to be different, but embrace who you are. Mm -hmm. You know, that was my, my biggest problem, trying to be like other people. Mm -hmm. And I, I always felt that I was different, okay. you know, but I was always trying to go against the grain, you know, and be cool. And I played the part pretty good, mm -hmm. but it was what was going on in the inside right. that was turning me up. Mm -hmm. So I guess I had to go through all the things that I went through to get me where I needed to be, where right. I was supposed to be. Okay. But basically just be yourself and find find some good role models, mm -hmm. good good people that you can confide in that will tell you good things and try to lead you in the right direction. Okay. What what is your daily motivation? God. That's awesome. And and, and my my daily motivation is is like I have a bucket list of things mm -hmm. that I want to do, but my ultimate goal is just to hear 
Well done, my good and faithful servant. I know that's right. I love that's, that. That's my ultimate goal. I love goal. that. I love that. Well, Scrap, again, first and foremost, I thank you for your willingness to come on my show and be transparent. Because a lot of people, they just aren't transparent about their story. But I'm a firm believer that your story can inspire someone else. And your story can touch that young man that may be in that fast lane. And if they hear you say, okay, I was incarcerated. I had a good job before I started doing what right. I was doing. But me being incarcerated helps me to grow. And then after my incarceration, I'm still able to live a purpose-filled life. I get up now, I go to work every day. Yeah. So that within itself, I applaud you for that alone. And then knowing that you have a strong relationship with God, because I know at your church now, you're a deacon, yes. very involved in your church. And so that alone, I salute you for just getting past everything that happened to you in your past. And so it's okay to that young lady or that young man, if you're facing time, if you're incarcerated right now, this right here, Mr. Wiley is a living testimony you that you again. can live again. You can have purpose again. And Mr. Wiley, you're such a humble person. I say that all the time. You just have a humble spirit about yourself. You walk around, you're very quiet, but when you open your mouth, you have powerful words. And if you all have never heard him speak before, he is a powerful speaker. So let me ask you a question. I like to go back to Kingdom Clothing. On social media, if they, if, can we just go, can they find you under Kingdom Clothing? Yes. Okay, so Kingdom if you go to social media, K. okay, go to Kingdom Clothing, and both words are spelled with the K. Look Mr. Wiley up, I encourage you all. If you need someone for a speaking engagement, please reach out to Mr. Wiley. Mr. Wiley, how can they get in touch with you if they're wanting you to come out and speak to a, um, a youth group or a men's group? How can they contact you? Well, my email is Wiley Dwayne, 1980 at gmail.com. Okay, so Wiley did you all get w that? Say it again, Mr. Wiley. Wiley Dwayne, 1980 at gmail.com. W I L E Y D W A Y N E, 1980 at gmail.com. So that's how you all can contact him for speaking engagements. And he's always somewhere doing speaking engagements. I've heard him several times. So I encourage you all, if you need someone to come out and talk to, like I said, a young men's group or a ladies group, or if you're having something at your church and your community, please reach out to him. He is an awesome, awesome speaker. So Mr. Wiley, as we end our interview, if you had one word to describe yourself, what would that word be? Humble. Yes. And he is, I mean, you just have such a humble spirit. He's very, he's a very soft spoken person. And I'm sure that you being incarcerated has something to do with that. Because when you were, when you were in the streets, you probably had to be someone totally different than that humbled person that was inside of you. I got, how much time we got? <laughs> <laughs> we have about four minutes. <laughs> well, I was, uh, I'm a, what, almost 10 year uh, recovered alcoholic. Mm. So alcohol did have me outside of my box, yes. you know, because other than that, I am very, very quiet. Mm. And it was just, you know, everything that I went through, everything that I was dealing with, I used alcohol to suppress it yeah. until it turned into an addiction. So I was fighting with two addictions right. at one time. Mm. And but God. prison, it, it got me, it removed me. And that was the first thing I asked God to do, remove that taste. Yes. And October 19th will be 10 years. That is so awesome. I applaud you for that. <laughs> that is so, so awesome. So again, you all, today's episode, we focused on living a purpose-filled life after a setback. And as you, as you heard this young man say, he was incarcerated. He dealt with alcoholism, but look at him now. So that's just a testament that you can do it. It can happen. So thank you again for thank stopping for by Talking Tea Time with Dr. Thank G. Thank you so much. When we return, Dr. G will be sharing one of my favorite teas. When I was in foster care, I never knew when I would have to move. So I always had my suitcase ready to go. Then one day I was adopted. 
My new parents open their hearts and home to me. My parents cook my favorite breakfast for me every morning. My parents take me on trips I never thought I would go on. They gave me a home and an even better reason to use that suitcase. My parents aren't perfect, but they're perfect for me. Hey, Bobo, do trees tell each other stories? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, why don't we go find out? Listen. Do clouds take naps? I couldn't tell you. Dad, do stars visit their friends? Look! I don't remember how it started. Go to that. Our back and forth. It always came back. Dad! You probably don't remember what you told me. That was perfect. But I heard every word. Hello and welcome back to Talking Tea Time with Dr. G. And as promised, I am sharing one of my favorite teas. In some past episodes, I have shared Lipton green tea, sweet tea from McDonald's, and Arnold Palmer, half and half. So today, I am sharing with you all a cha tea latte that I get from a coffee shop that's in Brentwood, and it's called Coma. And this cha tea latte, the reason that I really fell in love with it is because it has a very rich taste. When you taste it, it's not too sweet, it's not too sour, it's just right. And even if I don't drink it piping hot, I let it kind of cool down some, it still has that same great taste. And the aroma is great also. So again, this is cha tea latte from Coma in Brentwood. So if you have a favorite tea that you would like to share with Dr. G, you can email that to me at Talking Tea Time with Dr. G at gmail.com. And I look forward to seeing you all on the next episode of Talking Tea Time with Dr. G. Mm -hmm.